Welcome to another 21 Hats Dashboard. Every Monday, Gene Marks and I talk about the issues we think business owners should be following. Welcome, Gene. Hey, Lauren. Happy Monday. <laughs> happy to be here with you, Gene. Uh, <laughs> Gene, we, uh, we highlighted a story uh, this past week that I've been really eager to talk to you about. It's about a small business owner in the UK who kind of claims to have cracked the code on TikTok. Um, I guess first question before I tell you what this owner did, um, are you and your clients taking TikTok seriously yet? Have we reached that point? Um, first of all, it depends on the on the clients. I mean, remember, my clients are mostly small and mid-sized, family-owned, B2B businesses. Um, I don't really deal with a lot of, uh, you know, freelancers, influencers, yep. Yep. you know, people that are, you know, entertainers. That's the, usually not part of my client base. So I don't see a lot of it among them. Although I will say... I'm not on TikTok. I, I'm on TikTok. I'm personally on. Um, You're not on Instagram. TikTok either. TikTok, yeah, right. right. I can use a TikTok. You should have been talking a lot today. Um, but I'm on Instagram, just so you know, uh, where I, I don't post anything, but I follow a number of highly inappropriate accounts that were <laughs> recommended by my by my two sons that make me laugh out loud. And some of the TikTok <laughs> stuff, you know, lands on Instagram. So right, yeah, right. I like well, that stuff. It, the thing I liked about this story is that it kind of suggests that we're moving past the things that we kind of know TikTok for and mm. to a place where maybe not for your B2B clients, but for a lot of other businesses, it might be something worth paying attention to. And this is a small business, uh, a woman who just followed TikTok for a long time, trying to figure out what worked and what did and came to the conclusion that like a, a one minute video telling the story of her own business might connect. And uh, she saw lots of others do that. So she did it. She kind of told the story of her business just the way she would if she were talking to a friend. And the thing went viral. Her, her business is uh, selling um, kind of a, a holder for wine bottles to, to keep them cool when you take them on picnics, uh, that kind of thing. It's sure. a very small business, but the, uh, the viral video made a huge difference. And I guess two things. One, I thought is noteworthy about TikTok, but also just the the social media message of sharing your own story and being the face of your own business. What, what do you think of that? I mean, I, I think it's great. I, you know, I think this story is, did, did you even see how many hits it got on TikTok? How many views? I, don't even I know did. I don't remember. Uh, right. It, it, you know, it, it multiplied the amount of sales she had dramatically, yeah. but from a very small base. Uh, you know, my opinion, I think it's a one in a million story. I really do. I don't, I don't think it's easy to do. Um, I think that it's a, um, and you know, any social media person that, that I've talked to, if you want to succeed on a platform, it takes a long, long time of, of investment of time and you know, money and time on your behalf and uh, coming up with content and, you know, to build followers over a while. That's the whole thing. Um, you know, th this one, you're right. She, she managed to do it without, doing that work and i think you're yeah. right that I mean, that's unusual just, she got lucky i mean you know and it's you know if you're on social media long enough sometimes you know you, you post something and just just by luck somebody with a big following stumbles on it and then they share it and then suddenly like wow there's a lot of people like looking at that video and that's great but you know it's kind of like you know just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come and you can create a great video on tiktok um but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's um you know it, it's a one in a million shot that you're going to have the kind of success that that she had. I tell you what I am talking to, to my clients about and, and other business owners when it comes to TikTok and Instagram is um, is advertising on it for employees. I mean, it is a, you, you go to where the audience is. Right. And I just want to be clear for you. I'm on Instagram. Like I said, remember I follow all those inappropriate accounts. <laughs> I remember. But I do get a lot of, I get a lot, I'm happy to share some of them with you right now, Lauren, but <laughs> maybe, that, lose, maybe yeah. after we wrap yeah, this up. Yeah, the FCC will take your license away. Uh, but no, it is um, um, both on TikTok and Instagram. If you know, on Instagram where I'm at, I see a lot of brands that advertise for employees. Um, and you know, TikTok has a billion users. The demographic is younger. It's generally under 25. I think it's like 14 years old to 25 years old. But if that's the demographic you're looking for, um, I mean, you asked like, how can you leverage TikTok? Do we think it's a trend? I don't think it's, I don't think you're going to make any viral videos anytime soon, but I do think you can use that platform to create, you know, a, an interesting little enticing employment uh, ad and attract people to your business. Uh, great point. Next story. Uh, you and I have talk, uh, talked quite a bit 
about the vaccine mandate. It's finally come down. We, we knew it was coming since, I think, September, but the rules are out now. And I'm curious, uh, do you have any reaction, both for uh, the businesses that it hits directly, those with 100 or more employees, are, or also whether you think it'll have any impact on businesses with fewer than 100 employees? So, Will, you know, right now, the Department of Labor has left the door open that they might expand these rules to smaller businesses, those with less than 100 employees. So don't think if you're running a small business, you're you're off the hook. Um, you might very well not be off the hook for this for this thing. So that's number one. Number two is uh, we talked about the mandate before, so it's you know, we don't have to go back into it. But um, the companies that I'm talking about with, that I talked to with more than 100 employees are scrambling to figure out what to do. They're grumbling about it. They're not happy, and they don't want to lose any employees because if you if you don't comply. You could be facing a fine of up to fourteen thousand dollars per violation, so that can really add up. Uh, so, you know, the, Gina, are you the, giving the, these clients the advice that you gave on this show uh, a few weeks back to shut up and just do what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling them to do that. I actually am telling a lot of them to shut up, do what you're supposed to do. But if you want to do it a little slowly, you can do it a little slowly because there's going to be a lot of lawsuits about this, which may push this thing. You know, who knows? You know. Right. Then again, uh, I. I I heard that cases are spiking in Europe. So for all I know, this becomes a bigger issue. Um, you well, know, there is January, concern, especially yeah. after Thanksgiving and the holidays. Yeah. And so there's, you know, there's all that going on. So yay. But I, I, a couple of workarounds that I can I can tell you, legal workarounds, just, I'm just telling you what's going on in the field, you know, Lauren, okay? I, I have some, some you know, uh, business owners I talk to, they have more than 100 employees. Uh, they, they know that there's a few of their employees that are not going to comply. And the business owners, one, don't want to fight them. And number two, they don't want to lose them in this area of, you know, trying to find good employees. So what are they doing? Well, number one is the regulations don't or the rules don't apply to remote workers. So if you've got somebody that's an employee and they, they just don't want to, you know, you know, do this, um, you can temporarily move them out of your office. Say, okay, well then just work from home, you know, and we'll work that out with you. And that's just, that's one option. If that's by, something by the way, we should point out here, uh, we, we, I keep calling it a mandate and that's what everybody seems to be calling it. But it's, it's technically not, not it's a really a mandate. You have a yeah. choice. You don't yeah. have to get vaccinated. You can get tested every week. Yeah, you can get tested every week. So, you know, it's not that, you know, but it is a mandate in, to the sense that you've got to do one of those two things, right. you know, so Correct. so you can send people home to work remotely. The other thing, which is an intriguing idea that I'm, I'm going to be talking about with a few clients next week is um, for those employees, say you're an employee can't, you know, uh, you know, can't work from home or, or doesn't want to or whatever. There is the option of converting them to an independent contractor. Now, the rules for independent contractors have to be complied with, which means that you, you know, you, they might not be able to work all the same hours or they might not be able to, uh, you know, you, you have to have certain controls over what they do. But there is a scenario. There might be a scenario where you say, OK, I'll tell you what, for the foreseeable future, we're going to take you off a of payroll. You're no longer an employee or an independent contractor. We might have to cut your hours or move things around or do whatever. Uh, we might have to, you know, make sure you're still compensated so you can afford to carry on Cobra for your health insurance, for example, you know, um, there's some hoops that you would have to go through. Could this employee that you turn into a contractor still come into the office and work? So, yeah. Independent contractors mm -hmm. come into the, you know, come into businesses, you know, all the time. Now, can they, they can't work 40 hours a week and, you know, and among other things that you have to direct them, you know, you can't direct them what to do. There's, there's rules about independent contracting. Do you know what I mean? Yes. But it is a potential. I mean, listen, where, you know, you've got employers that are trying to serve, you know, the, the government's rules while also trying to keep their employees, you know, and they don't want to pay these big fines and they don't want to fire people. So maybe there's something to do with independent contracting as well. That's a conversation you want to have with your accountant. Um, and, and you can go through the rules themselves and who knows, maybe you can come up with a solution that way. I, I know the results have varied around the country. There have been quite a few places, including the uh, New York City Police Department, hmm. where in the end, most employees have complied and gotten the vaccination. Is that Yeah. And then I see studies that say up to 70% of employees re will refuse to comply. You know, 70? I some, haven't seen that. Yeah. Some crazy number like that, you know, which that sounds like really, you know, pretty high. I think they took that entire report in like some county in Alabama. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's probably where that came from. But it, it listen, I mean, you know, the, the key is now, by the way, one final option. I just want to, you know, also want to throw there. 
you pay the fine. I mean, if you've got a really good employee, uh, it's a cost of doing business and you're like, I don't want to lose this person. It's 14 grand, but this guy's per generating, incident. You know, yeah. It's per incident. Well, per violation. So you have that employee that's violating. Um, and that's a good question. Does that mean like what every week that it goes by, he doesn't get a test. You have to pay 14 grand or is it just that employee is not, you know, these are the questions that are yeah. kind of gray right now. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Um, but if it's affordable to pay the fine, itself, maybe you say to yourself, all right, well, that sucks, but you know, this guy's generating profits for me and I don't want to lose them. And that's another potential option as well. When you said, uh, con- mentioned contractors, I thought you were going to suggest that an employer with around a hundred employees put some of them on a contract basis yeah. and yep. get under a hundred. Yep. Also, you know, I'm sure that, somebody's that- doing that. Yep. That could, that could also be, you know, the, the way that you work around that as well. Or, um, you know, and then again, there's also, you see the other problem with the mandate, or we call it the mandate, but the rules themselves still need some more, you know, they've opened up more questions about how you define an employee. So can you put people on part-time? Do they still count as an employee? Um, you know, so there, the, the, I guess there's ways to wiggle around this, you know, and I'm not saying you should, if, you know, I, I don't know, I, I think people should get vaccinated, but people have reasons for not. And I respect that. Um, and, and I respect business owners that are trying to make a freaking profit. So, you know, they want to keep their employees around and trying to figure out a solution that works. Next story, another topic that business owners love and always look forward to. It's health insurance season. Yay! <laughs> Gene, you wrote about this recently for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, do you have some good news for us when it comes to health insurance? Any <laughs> opportunities to point business owners toward? Yeah, I mean, listen, there, there's, I wrote about it because I said the, you know, the exchanges, the, the enrollment period uh, just opened up now on November 1st. So it opened up last week and it is, uh, will, will last until January, depending on the, the You're talking about the uh, Obamacare. Uh, Correct. Health. The Obamacare exchanges. Right. So, um, you know, you might want to give this some thoughts. So first of all, if you are an employer and if you don't employ, uh, don't have a health insurance plan, or if you um, uh, are self-employed or a freelancer, you should definitely be not only revisiting the Obamacare exchange because there's a lot of generous, you know, tax credits available, but also, you know, to do your part for your employees at the very least, maybe you can help them get insurance on the Obamacare exchanges. So I know a lot of small employers that aren't offering plans are still providing assistance, you know, just, you know, consultative assistance to their, to their employees to help them get health insurance. Cause you don't want to lose them to somebody else that's offering a health insurance plan. So there's one. Um, number two is there's, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, suggestions where employers can move employees off of their health plan and have them go to Medicaid. So, you know, if an employee you know, qualifies for Medicaid uh, because of their income level, um, then you can, you know, take them off your health insurance plans and help them get on Medicaid. And it might be, you know, you just as good coverage for a lower cost, both for the employee and for you. Um, and then the third one, which is the biggest one are HRAs, which are health reimbursement accounts, Lauren. And those were, you know, those HRAs are, they, they were kind of verboten originally under the Affordable Care Act. And then President Trump, you know, issued an executive order, you know, you know, basically allowing them and, and president Biden, well, of all the executive orders that he overturned from, from president Trump, this is the one that he let stand, you know, stand because they're pretty popular. And an HRA is one it's becoming popular among a lot of my clients because it gets you out of the healthcare business. You basically set up an HRA, a health reimbursement account for your employee. You contribute money pre-tax so they don't get taxed on it as income and you get a deduction and then they can take the money and buy their own health insurance wherever the hell they want to buy it. So they can go to the exchanges, they can go to uh, their health insurance broker, they can do whatever the heck they want to do, and you're not involved anymore. You know, you're not negotiating. Which actually insurance. is what I have always thought should have been the goal with yeah. Obamacare and every other initiative with health insurance. It makes no sense for it to be employer-based, and except for the fact that a lot of people are happy with it and don't like change, and they want to stick yep. with what they've got, what they know. But it's crazy that business owners have to deal with it. It is crazy. I remember when my wife moved over from England, she was like, what the heck, you know, is uh, my, <laughs> my health? You know what I mean? So, 
Um, I'm actually, and that's a topic for another day, but I, I am actually in favor of, of national health for this company, for Whoa. this country. I don't know if we'll ever get there. I think that a national health will significantly benefit business owners. It would remove an enormous headache and cost for me. And um, I've written about it before, and I'm more than happy to take people on to debate that, but I do think <laughs> national health is... So I, I think it could be a great thing for small businesses. It'll never happen, though, but well, I think it would be. I mean, the Affordable Care Act was a step in that direction. It was. Um, yeah. And business owners didn't fully embrace it, although some did. Um, yeah. But yeah. we'll leave that for another day, as you say. Uh, last question, Gene. Um, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're referring to, uh, there was a great report in the Wall Street Journal this week. Uh, there was a professor at King's College um, in London who accumulated like a hundred separate studies that have been done in the past about entrepreneurship and 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 happiness. Um, with the question is like, are entrepreneurs more happy than everybody else? And um, the conclusion was... Yes, they are more happy than everybody. How about but, that, Lauren? But also more stressed. More stressed as well. And there are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of reasons that people will give for why they're happy. I'm certainly happier doing this than working for you know a company, but yeah, which you've no, done in the past. I have done, yeah. I've worked for a few different companies, but I I have to say that the um, uh, it's not for everybody. You know, I mean, you know, I know I personally know people that struggle running their own businesses. Like they're not thrilled with it. Uh, they'd rather be employees. They don't want all the headaches. It's, it can be pretty dark times if you're a small business owner. But for the most part, people um, these studies have found that business owners though they're more stressed, they are happier. And, you know, Lauren, I mean, listen, you're an entrepreneur, right? So you're, 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 I don't you're, know when you're you become it. an entrepreneur. Um, well, I think I mean, might need to be a little further down the road, but but I well, I know what you're yeah. referring to. Yeah. So the question is, are you happy? <laughs> well, I'll be I'll be happier if um, you were making more money. If it, well, there's more evidence that what I'm doing is oh. is going to succeed. And Lord, join the crowd. Yeah. I've been waiting for that evidence <laughs> in my business for about 25 years. You know, I mean, we're never, you're never well, going to get. But to after that 25 level. years, I think the answer is in. It worked. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, or I'm just stupid, but it is a, um, you know, I, I tell you, I, I think the reason why I'm happier and I think a lot of business owners would agree with that, um, Lauren, is that, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm doing the great thing for society or, you know, well, I'm contributing or I'm like, you know, whatever. I love what I do and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my thing is I got control, more control over my life because I don't have to work, I have a boss. You know what I mean? I have like 600 bosses. Um, so I can divide that up. <laughs> I didn't know I just, what you mean. And, and here's, yeah. I mean, here's how they answer you, the question you put to me, which is, you know, if I could press a button and go back to the job I quit to do this, would I press that button? And the answer is no. Even though right. uh, this hasn't been proven out yet, uh, I do love being responsible for my own success or right. failure. And, right. you know, that does make me happy. Agreed. Good. All right. Glad we settled that. Um, Gene <laughs> Marks is president of the Marks Group, a consulting firm that advises small businesses, especially about their technology needs. He also hosts his own podcast, Small Biz Ahead, with the Hartford Insurance. You can find it at sba.hartford.com. And if you want to know more about any of these stories, uh, you can read the 21 Hats Morning Report, where we highlight the most important news of the day for business owners five days a week. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Lauren. We will see you next week. Always great speaking with you. Have a great week, everyone.